Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Dennis Wan from Purdue University, and it's my honor to bring to you my research about the impact of reinforcement layers, site cover, and bond stress on knee joints under a closing moment. And my advisor is uh, Professor Williams. And thank you very much for joining me, joining my presentation during this inconvenience. Okay, so first of all, I'll introduce you about the online. So first I'll introduce about the, my research generally and followed by my experimental program. And then I'll show you the test results. And then based on the results, I'll give you an evaluation of the current ACI provisions on how to uh, design knee, closing knee joints. And finally, uh, in the, the last, I'll give you uh, quick conclusions. So first things, Things should have uh, things happens uh, from using a strong time model to design uh, closing moment. I mean, knee joints under a closing moment. When a, a knee joint, when a knee joint is un under a closing moment, uh, we are we arrange the strong time model like the like this. So first we put ties on top and ties on the left to equilibrate. The two type force, we need a diagonal strut like here. In this way, the designer can easily propose proportion reinforcement like my sketch here. So everything seems to be very clear and fine. However, here we have a node named curveball node here. Previously, we didn't know how to address this node, but thanks to the ACI code and client's research, uh, they provide us several equations to design this kind of curve node when using a strong time model to design knee joints on the closing moment. So first of all, we have to address the radial stress that happen that happens over the bar band here. So first we have to make sure the bar band is large enough to take the radial stress using this equation. And the next one, when when the bar force is different on both sides, uh, the diagonal strut force, the diagonal strut angle will be other than 45 degree. In this case, we will have circumferential bound stress along the bar like this, along the bar. So in this case, we need to make sure the bar band or the length of the bar band is long enough to develop this the circumferential bound stress because the, the tie force is different on both sides. And the next one, we have to make sure the clear side cover is thick enough to prevent any potential splitting of the concrete. And the requirement is the thickness, the clear side cover has to be larger than 2 dB. The dB is the bar diameter. If this requirement is not satisfied, we need to further enlarge the bar band or the band radius by a factor of 2 dB divided by C sub C is the C sub C is the thickness of the clear side cover. So based on this, uh, although right now we have the three equations to design the curve bar node using strong time model, we still don't know the accuracy or if it's conservative. We need more experimental evaluation, and that's that's why I uh, we developed this experimental program to investigate all the uh, the parameters here. So based on these, I developed an experimental program with a series of specimens. So for the first three, we are we were going to uh, <coughs> sorry investigate these three equations. Moreover, because the minimum distributed reinforcement in the knee joint is also very interesting, so we put more specimens about to investigate uh, this parameter. So as you know, the the main per the main parameter is the band radius here. And uh, from here, we know the band radius requirement is also related to the mechanical reinforcement ratio. So this is also the other interesting parameter we want to investigate. So based on this, we developed five different series of specimen and 22 specimen in total of knee joints under closing moment. So first we have single layer of longitudinal bars and double layer of longitudinal bars because we, we didn't know uh, how the specimen behave differently if it's, it's, it's reinforced with double layer of longitudinal bars. And the third one is the different cross sections because we want to create different uh, di diagonal strut angle 
which is data state here. We want a different one. So we set this as the, another uh, variable. And of course, we have thin, thinner clear side cover to, to investigate this equation. And also we have the specimen with distributed reinforcement in, in the joint, which is which satisfies the minimum requirement in the ACI code. All right, so based on the criterion, we, uh, let me show you the specimen details. So first we have the specimen, knee joint specimen shaped like this, an L-shaped specimen. And uh, so as, as, uh, as I said, we are going to investigate the radial stress requirement for radial stress, which is this and the clear side cover. So here we have different band radius here. And uh, like I said, the mechanical reinforcement ratio is also very interesting. So we put different uh, amount of reinforcement and the different grade of country to create a different mechanical reinforcement ratio. And of course the RB is different too. And uh, other than that, we, we didn't want any shear failure because we want to test the joint itself. We didn't want any shear failure or anchorage fa failure in either. So we put a huge amount of reinforcement or stirrups in the legs, in the legs to prevent that from happening. As well, we put the uh, steel plate here to prevent an anchorage failure. And uh, beside this, So here, just like I said, we want to test the double layer theory. Sorry. Okay, yeah. So we want to test the, the different behavior from double layer longitudinal bars. So we also design specimen with double layer longitudinal bars here. And uh, it, I have to mention that because the code says we need to calculate the band radius based on the inner layer. So we so this requirement is actually based on the inner inner layer of the longitudinal bars. And the third one, we investigated the clear side cover series because uh, so I just reduced the clear side cover from 1.5 inches to 0.75 inches to see how they behave differently. And the next one, here we put minimum distributed reinforcement in a joint like this, like here, to see how they affect the overall behavior of the knee joint specimens. And the next one, so for this series, the cross section is different, just like you, you can see on the screen to investigate how the angle of the strut, the diagonal strut affect the overall behavior and evaluate this equation. So for this specimen, uh, we just reduce the depth of one leg, which is which is shallower than the other, and then we have a different strut, uh, diagonal strut angle, just like you see on the screen. All right. So after a long time curing and building, finally we we can we can set up our test frame. So this is a test frame I've used in the lab. So first, it's composed of a uh, steel crosshead, two steel crosshats here and here. And uh, between, between these two crosshats, I used tensioning rods to make, to make a self-reacting system. So on one side, I put low cells to measure the, the load. And on the other side, I use hydraulic cylinders to create, to, to apply load in the, in the specimen. So the load is applied horizontally to create closing moment in the joint. And the, besides the test setup, I also put four columns as a bracing system, just in case to prevent any accident from happening or uh, like the toppling of the specimen. So here I put four columns. All right, so after everything is set up, uh, next we, I'm going to introduce you my in instrumentation. So here I use linear potentiometers to measure the relative displacement between legs. And also I, I put inclinometers on top to monitor the rotation. Uh, moreover, I, I put strain gauges along the bar, longitudinal bars to capture strain. 
in the joint, especially in the center of the band and the beginning of the band, because we want the information about the stress uh, flowing in the joint. That's why we put the string gauges in on the longitudinal bars. And other than that, something is very something very important to introduce is the support. I used supports composed of steel plates and the PTFE sheets in which uh, with rollers, rollers uh, were underneath this support to eliminate uh, all the friction because we don't want any friction to affect the test results. So everything's ready. Let's test the specimen. So first on, on the left-hand side, the, the, the specimen is composed, is reinforced with standard band. So let's see what happens. So this is me pumping up the, the specimen and the, yeah, so it failed very soon after I started to play the video. It, it took only 11 seconds of the video links, but on the other, other hand, if, what if we use the required, sorry, yeah, what if we use the required band radius? What's happening is it, it took much longer to fail a specimen, although it has damaged a lot, damaged a lot in at the re-entrant corner, but the specimen is still there. It's hold there. It, it didn't it didn't want to fail. Just by altering the band radius, the behavior is altered a lot. So this, this is a comparison of two cases. The first is the standard band and the other is when we use the required band radius. Yeah, so after this, let's do a, a comparison between different specimens, different examples. So this is a specimen reinforced using number A bars with standard band and something in between and the required band radius. And the band radius, Radius ratio is defined as the actual band radius divided by the required band radius, uh, which is which which is two two ASFY divided by something, just like I said in the previous slides. So, if we compare these three uh, pictures, we found if we use a standard band or the band radius is lower than the required one, we have we have a spread off behavior of the specimen. It's it's like a splitting of struts. But if we, if we use the required band radius, uh, for example, the band radius is higher than the required one, we had the uh, crushing and the CCC node here, and the behavior is very ductile. And if we use the band, radi in, band radius in between, we found that the failure mode or the damage pattern is also in between. For example, it's like a splitting of the bar, the concrete at the bar band here, and the, the crushing and the CCC node. So both happens. And the, the ductility is also in between. Yeah, so next let's let's take a look at some numbers. So for this curve, the, the, the specimen is reinforced with the standard band, and this one is using the required band radius. And you can see very clearly that the difference happens when we use different band radii. So first, if we use standard band, the the specimen didn't even reach the calculated strength. And for the other two, they reach the they reach the calculated strength. However, if we use the band radius in between, we found the ductility is lower than when we use uh, the required band radius. So the band radius, the band radius alters not only the failure pattern, but also the behavior, the overall behavior, especially it's a lot load carrying capacity and the displacement ductility. And uh, it's very interesting to take a look at the specimen with reinforcement, distributed reinforcement in the joint. So I just put reinforcement like, like you can see on the screen here. And both are reinforced with standard band in the joint. And however, uh, the transverse reinforcement didn't help very significantly because they still failed due to the splitting of strut. But the thing, the difference is it gradually failed due to the splitting of strut. When I say gradual, uh, let's take a look at numbers and the plots. 
So here, the blue line is the standard band without this trans transverse reinforcement in the joint. And uh, the purple line is with distributed reinforcement. Uh, as you can see, the distributed one still cannot reach the, the calculated load as shown on, shown on the screen, the red line, indicated the red, red line. It, it didn't help with the strength, but it slowed down. It slowed down a little bit of the, the, the failure pr procedure, on, I mean, the process. And the, the standard one without the distributed reinforcement, when it reached the peak load, it dropped immediately, unlike the specimen with distributed reinforcement. But both cannot be compared to uh, the required uh, specimen with required bend radius because not only it improved the strength, but the ductility was also improved uh, significantly, like this. All right, the bend radius is also affecting the strain along bars. So if we put standard bend, we found the yield region, the yield region only reached the joint face here, or sometimes it, it didn't even reach this region. But if we use the required bend radius, we found the yielding of the bar throughout the whole bend region. That means every, every part of the bar yielded if we use the required bend radius. And if we use in between, the result is also in between. So we can conclude if we use the required band radius, the strong time model we assumed was achieved. That's a very important side because the, the requirement is it's very useful. If we want to use the strong time model to design a curve bar node and the knee joints on the closing moment. And next, so based on all the behavior I've introduced, uh, let's categorize all the specimen. So depending on their behavior, we can categorize the specimen into three categories. The first is strength compromised or lacking the ductility. And the second one is in transition or ductility compromised, or we will have a ductile behavior uh, for this specimen. If they, if they meet the requirement underneath the title. So for example, if we have a specimen, it fails because the CCC node crushing and the p-test is greater than the calculated one, and the ductility is very good, and the yielding through the entire bar band, we, we just put that specimen into the ductile, ductile behavior, and so as other two categories. So keep that in mind, let's do the categorization. So first, uh, I, I just put the double layer series here and single layer series, and the specimen with the transference reinforcement on the same plot and this plot is uh, shows that the joint efficiency or p test divided by p calculated uh, with regard to the bend radius ratio. And note the bend radius radius ratio is based on this equation. All right, so we found these six specimens can be categorized as strength compromised because they they satisfy the criterion, just like I introduced you uh, in the previous slide. And these four are in transition, and these four are in ductile behavior. So it's fair to say, or to draw lines like this, if the band radius ratio is greater than one, we will have behave we we will have ductile behavior. In between, we have between 0.5 and one, we have transition, and under 0.5, we have strains compromised. And uh, so we can fair to say it's appropriate, appropriate to use this equation to design the band radius. But if we take a look at the thinner cover, again, the band radius, radius ratio is based on this, which, which has the factor, the mod modification factor for the thinner cover. But in this case, we, we apply the same procedure, but we found uh, the whole thing shifted uh, a little bit left. That means we don't even need to uh, satisfy this requirement to have a ductile behavior. So we can say the current factor of two, two dB divided by CC is very conservative. And then if we take a look at the last one, the bound stress one, and uh, we found, we used the same categorization and we found both specimen had a strength higher than the peak calculated 
that mean the calculated load, but actually their band radius ratio is way under this equation. So we can say we uh, it, we can revisit this equation because it's over overly conservative. So based on that, I can give you some conclusions. So first, as predicted by the model for curve bar node, the band radius affected the strength, ductility, and the failure mode significantly, just like you can see previously. And uh, the requirement for the radial stress, which is this, is appropriate. And uh, the cover factor to modify the band radius requirement is conservative. But this one for the bound stress, the circumferential bound stress, it could be revisited because it's pretty con overly conservative. And we also found the distributed reinforcement, they, they just slowed the failure, but they actually did not increase the strength. Uh, so this is a, another very interesting findings in this uh, research. All right, so that's all I have for you. And thank you very much. And any questions about and comments about the research and the investigation? Yeah, thank you very much. We have a couple questions. Did you do any analytical work to compare with the physical testing that you presented today? Oh, yes, it's it's under, yeah, I'm, I'm still doing some analytical and the final element, and I'll do more more numerical tests to, to verify and uh, to make sure all the re requirements and equations are um, applicable to the curve node design. So it's still under investigation. Okay. Yeah. I, I think I may have missed, uh, Dennis, how did you figure that the, the reinforcement yielded along the entire bar length? Did you have more than one gauge on on those bars? Uh, yes, I distributed uh, uh, various, uh, I mean, the string gauges on, on, at the various positions from the joint face and bar bend and the center of bend. If we found all the string gauges yielded and we we can infer from that that the the yielding region reaches the entire throughout the entire bar band. Another question we have is how can these results improve the design of knee joints? Uh, yeah. So previously we just used a uh, standard band to anchor the longitudinal bars in the joint, but actually if we just use standard band like you see, uh, like just you uh, you you saw in the slides the the behavior is actually lower i mean inferior to if we use a high a larger band radius so we propose a different equations to we need to enlarge the band radius in the joint just unlike the previously we did we just put standard band but actually it's not as good as we if you use using larger band radius 